please, will you welcome Nigella and Sam to the stage? So we thought we'd start by talking about the process of, of book writing, but writing cookery books in particular. Mm. So you've spent the last year in the kitchen. And, and uh, lying in bed with my laptop writing. Um, I think that for me, uh, writing a book is not a very, it's not actually a very linear process in the sense that I get an idea for what a book might be, but I don't get that idea until I've been cooking quite a bit. So sometimes I think, I think I might be writing one book, but then I'm cooking and something else emerges. And generally it's because what emerges is what I'm cooking uh, just to feed me and my family. I think it's difficult. I don't like to write down a recipe until I've cooked it several times. And I feel I need, I know I need to think about what, what that recipe means. I mean, I'd, what it means to me, why it's there, because it's not really good, just good enough that you can cook something and it will taste good. It has to have, to me, it has to be connected to other things that are in the book and I have to feel I want to cook it again and again and again. There's really an autobiographical strand, isn't there, in, in your books, if you go back through, well, right back to the beginning, mm. really. Um, this feels, it really feels especially true of Simply Nigella. Do you, did you feel that? I don't think it's especially true. I think that I can't, I can't write except in that way. Um, and, I, and I think I certainly mean, uh, by autobiographical, I feel that that is in the sense of a diary, not in a confessional sense. Uh, but I feel that my books chart my life so in the same way that How to Eat has got a chapter on weaning and feeding, you know, babies and toddlers. And yeah, <laughs> it goes on and then, <laughs> and I've done all that, you know, Feast has got a chapter on, you know, I think it was Teen Feast or whatever that I, that I did. But I, I think that for me, a recipe is, you know, as I've said, you know, a highly charged autobiographical form. It comes from a stage in my life and it means something to me. And even though, obviously, I don't stop cooking certain recipes when that time has passed, it, it, it puts me, when I cook those things, it, 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 in a way, it, it reminds me of the past. And, in, and sometimes when I look at my books, it's a bit like looking at a photograph album. And now it's certainly true that in some of my books there are pictures, say, of my children when they're younger, not very much. But nevertheless, I... I, I, can, I so remember the making of each book. I remember when, what kitchen I was in. I remember uh, what we ate while I was testing all the recipes, even the recipes that didn't make it into the book. And, I, and that, so because of that, they just do feel, they feel very much like chunks of my life. Did you treat recipes like that before you started writing cookery books? Were they always slightly, did they always have that personal kind of journal sense to them? Well. I, I, I think they did in, in the sense that writing for me is a way of that I connect uh, with elements of my past. Um, I'm not sure that I thought of rest. I, I don't really think I, you know, cooked or thought in terms of recipes before I started writing about food. And when I first started writing about food, it was more narrative and it was a discussion. And then I, I found I moved into recipes sometimes still within the within a body of text, but then I did feel that actually I wanted to discuss the recipe in a way that made sense to the reader as well, which meant writing it down as a recipe. Um, but, you know, I think that one, one of the reasons I started writing about food, and it's only one of the reasons, and there are lots of reasons, none of them were planned, were that my mother and one of my sisters died very young, and I felt it was very important for me, before I even got into doing a book, to re remember, obviously I didn't, there's no, there's no question of forgetting, but to remember, or memorialize is better, mm -hmm. to remember them in a, w in a way that seems so important, which is through their food, and through the food I ate with them. So I think that in that sense, it, uh, a recipe for chicken is never just a recipe for chicken. It's uh, remembering the way my mother would, would, would cook her chicken, or the way, remembering what, you know, eating around that, 
the old blue for mica table. And all, all that sort of thing seems to me that the cooking has cooking has to be that. And I suppose you know, it became very important for me that my children could uh, eat my mother's food, even though obviously they ne never got a chance to meet her. But I think that cooking is always a form of uh, connection. I think you feel connected to either the pe someone who's given you the recipe or in my case, my, as my mother never wrote, wrote, wrote down recipes or cooked from recipes, or you're connected to the person who fed you that food, even if you change it. And you're also connected, I feel, I, I feel very connected with myself when I cook and, as, um, and with other people, because you're thinking of feeding other people or feeding yourself. And that I like that moment for me of, you know, I started going into a new age now, but you, know, you feel <laughs> connected with, it's my bit of being connected with the earth since I'm an entirely <laughs> urban creature. So, you know, chopping up an onion or, you know, holding a bulb of garlic is my, it's my bit of communion with nature. That's as close as you're getting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you're, um, you'd say your mother came back from holidays with recipes instead of photographs. Is that, um, is that habit you've picked up, do you think? Um, yes, but she would come back with recipes that she would uh, you know, just want to cook because she tasted, you know, and when in the, I don't remember, in the 70s, I think she must have gone, I think she went to Corfu, and <laughs> then when she came back, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of taramis salata and hummus oh, smoking. Yeah. And a lot of, uh, that was, and moussaka for a while, but they, I certainly, uh, I, I remember that as, those days very fondly, but I do, I mean, actually, it's one of, a great blessing to me, that you know you don't have to send your you know you don't have to send a roll of film to the chemist to get developed anymore because when my children were quite young I used to go take everything to the Neil the local pharmacist who got everything developed and I always used to feel I had to say to him look I'm really sorry that you know there are eight pictures of a tomato stall and maybe <laughs> one of the children doing something yeah. all my photos are of food so I do I do that I think that. If you like eating and you're interested in, in um, cooking and travel is about the food, um, I will always, you know, I don't, I don't read, I, don't, I never read a guide about where I should, what I should go and see. I just read about the food <laughs> and the restaurants nearby and uh, go and see, you know, I like going into great food shops or kitchen shops. So you're a lifelong avocado fan, aren't you? How did I'll the love you, affair start? My love affair started with my great aunt Myra. <laughs> and she liked, she um, was a great cook. And I used to go and stay with her in Sussex. And she was a great cook. And she also did, she liked a bit more innovation than a lot of my family. And sometimes it, Sometimes things worked, sometimes they didn't, and sort of avocados when, you know, in the 70s when avocados were this new exciting uh, feature in the shops. Um, I think my mother was quite dismissive of them because she just thought they were just sort of faddish and overpriced. Um, but, but Myra would, um, she didn't like to be called aunt or great aunt in particular. Mm. So Myra did, do, she did one thing that didn't quite work, which is she did do a kind of, sauteed calf's liver with some sauteed avocado slices. Now, not, <laughs> not that she'd read it somewhere. <laughs> she'd cut it out of, you know, oh some God. 70s magazine, gave it a go. Um, you've got to give mm. things a go. Um, I've had avocado fries in America. Uh, okay. See? Yeah, no, and so you've got to right. give everything it's a go. It's the liver. It's the liver you, and avocado. Get, they're both, the, the, but the textures are too similar, exactly. <laughs> um, but she did a, she's made something which I've got on How to Eat, my first book, which is an avocado mint and pea salad. She used fresh peas, mm. I unabashedly used frozen peas. Um, and it's fabulous. And so I, I began to like avocados then. I think that, but I, I have carried, you know, just carried on. <laughs> Um, over the years, you've become quite outspoken about the way that food is used to suppress appetite, uh, suppress women's appetites. Um, and in Simply Nigella, you've got some quite damning words for the Clean Eating Brigade. 
What do you think is most harmful about that? Yes, I feel that I was very negative about the, you know, the clean eating brigade, but actually it's not the brigade I mind, it's the term clean eating. Because I think the term clean eating makes it seem as if every any other form of eating is dirty or shameful and i think that's bad i if look obviously if you're saying clean eating is not eating processed food well like who's going to argue mm -hmm. that is obvious but i do think that uh there is a way in which food is used to either to self-congratulate you're a better person because you're eating like that or to self-persecute because you're not allowing yourself to eat the things you want to eat. And in, and in some way, I don't like, I don't like any form, I don't like a moral, uh, moral weight mm. being given to either the size people are or their food intake. People who always say, oh no, I don't, I don't eat sweet things. They're always the ones who are left hunched over the cake with a fork, <laughs> picking yeah. bits, and they, ha they eat so much more than someone who's had a slice of cake. Yeah. So I'm all, that is also ne does need to be said. Yeah. So many people always say to me, oh, what's your guilty pleasure you know, in eating? And I always feel like, you know, really, the one thing you've got to feel guilty about is not taking pleasure. If you, if it, if you feel guilty about it, well, you, that you're robbing yourself of that pleasure. And it seems to me just a, a, a crime. How do you think your approach to food has changed as you've grown up, grown older, grown? Well, yes, well, how, <clears throat> well my, my approach to food has changed, you know, from the beginning that I know that the recipes I, I cooked before I had children often um, demanded a bit more time. And then I really <laughs> rapidly ran out of time. <laughs> And now I feel that I, I suppose, you know, I have eaten more dinners than I'm going to eat. <laughs> and therefore, I'm absolutely determined that I don't waste an eating opportunity. Unfortunately, <laughs> I had been on the road for a, a month, and some eating opportunities were not everything they could have been. Um, <laughs> but I'm making up for it. Um, Although I was just saying to you, having you know been in a hotel room for a month, all I do is crave green vegetables and something with crunch at the moment. Um, but I, but I feel, I re I feel that I am busy. There is a lot on, but I need. I'm so aware of the importance of of things that people often think are small things, and the small things are just the preparing a meal, uh, making sure it, that I can get some pleasure from it as I cook. I mean, I cook very simply, and I think maybe I, I'm, f even from the beginning, every book in a way is a simplification. And I suppose with any luck, one hopes that life will also be a simplification, <laughs> but certainly I find it easier to do with um, with food, so I think that is, is is that getting older is is I think a, a has to be a process of concentrating on what matters and doing away uh, with things which which aren't so central to one's happiness and equilibrium. Of course, one has to do an awful lot and contend with an awful lot that you know makes life stressful, but that's also important. You know, the furnace has to the furnace has to be fed. Uh, but I certainly think maybe my food, my cooking gets simpler, but I also f feel it's very important not to become, you know, one of those people who always looks back and doesn't look forward. And so I do like experimenting with new flavors and new foods. I don't want to, I don't want it, I don't want food just to be an endless <coughs> remaking of the past. It's about bringing the past into the present, but knowing that the present has got to stay open.